let's talk architecture. Architecture, at least in information technology terms, is about the decisions that we make when we're building IT systems or applications. Cloud architecture refers to the decisions we make when we're building things in, well, the cloud. And believe me, the decisions available to us are a plenty. Now, it takes years of practice and experience to become a good cloud architect, so we're certainly not gonna do it justice here. But as you've started your cloud journey, there are a few concepts that might be useful as you build out that business case. In this module, we're going to talk about some of the reasons why companies move to the cloud. We're also going to cover some common cloud migration approaches and talk about why virtualization and containerization are often part of cloud adoptions. There are several reasons why companies may move to the cloud. Now, of course, we could accomplish these things without the cloud like we've been doing for years, but the cloud does introduce some new business capabilities through cost effectiveness or accessibility. A very common reason companies first get interested into the cloud is fault tolerance. Now, if you're a company that values your existence, you'll have some sort of disaster recovery plan. These plans usually involve some alternate place where you can store data or you're able to recreate key business systems in the event that your primary data center has some sort of problem. Now, traditionally, this was done by contracting with some provider to keep a physical second copy of your hardware ready to go at a moment's notice. Only problem is that when everything's up and running fine, that backup physical hardware is just sitting around collecting dust and becoming obsolete, but you're still paying for it. Now, sure, it's an insurance policy, but what if there was a better way? Rather than buying all your backup equipment, why not just rent it only when you need it? Cloud providers have massive amounts of system capacity available to you in seconds and you only have to pay for what you use, which is almost always a huge cost savings. Then when the crisis is over, you can just shut those things down and stop paying. It's the same concept as me taking an Uber or a taxi to get somewhere versus buying a car. Now, if I need that car all the time, then it would probably make more sense over time just to buy the car. But if you're constantly needing your backup site, then I'm afraid you've got some big problems. Another reason companies adopt the cloud is scalability. Scale is how much or how little capacity we need to meet business needs. Now, obviously our goal is to have our capacity as close to our need as possible, but that's a pretty tricky thing to forecast. The pay-as-you-go model of cloud providers enables us flexibility and the ability to scale up or scale down depending on our needs. Globalization is another common reason for cloud adoption. As a company grows and expands beyond their home borders, it makes sense to have resources and services close to those new markets, maybe for regulatory reasons or maybe performance reasons. Cloud providers already have data centers and resources in various geographies available, and you can use those with little more than a click of a button. Perhaps the most valuable business reason for cloud adoption is agility. Agility is the ability to respond to changing needs. In many companies, if I wanted to run an experiment that required IT equipment, I would likely have to endure a requisition and procurement process and secure resources from the IT group to set up and maintain that equipment. And that could take weeks or months. In the cloud, I could get access to that equipment in a matter of minutes, and I could try my experiment and then shut down the equipment. I could get my results maybe in a day versus a month, and it might only cost me a few cents. Now, there are many other ways that the cloud enables agility that we won't go into here, but know that as abstract as it may seem, studies have correlated cloud adoption to organizational benefit through that agility. And then there's cost. Cost is a funny thing. While we would like to think it's a very straightforward thing, the reality is that most companies are not very good at tracking true costs. With cloud providers, costs are very literal. They show up on a bill. 
Some companies are surprised to learn that their costs might be more than what they believe their on-site data center costs to be. But pulling together the total cost of ownership, or TCO, is pretty difficult. Are you including power and heating and cooling and fire suppression in your calculation? How about any security measures like card readers or security cameras? Sometimes it's just in how your company chooses to account for your IT assets that can significantly change the cost landscape. These hidden costs add up. Now, at the opposite end of the spectrum, if you misuse your cloud resources, they can easily cost dramatically more than any sort of on-site data center. And this is why it is so important to train your staff and involve experienced cloud architects. A thorough cloud adoption strategy will have specific governance as and cost management components. And we're gonna cover those in another module. So cost savings can be realized, but be careful about the expectations you set, especially in the early days. Let's talk about some cloud strategies. When people say moving to the cloud, they're usually referring to the public cloud. These are the big providers like AWS, GCP, and Alibaba, for example. Some large traditional IT companies like SAP, IBM, and Oracle have created public cloud businesses as a way to complement their traditional business. Microsoft Azure is a good example of this. We call these public clouds because they're indeed open to the public. Anybody with an internet connection and a credit card can use their services. Then we have private clouds. Private clouds are intended to be used solely by a single organization or a company. Companies can set up private clouds in their own data centers or in some other hosting provider. When companies make use of multiple clouds, be it public or private, we call this multi-cloud. Most established companies will use a multi-cloud approach referred to as hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud means that you use both private and public cloud resources, and maybe you shuffle workloads between them. It's quite common for companies to use as much of their own computing resources as possible, and then use public cloud resources to handle temporary exceptions. In fact, most companies offer a hybrid cloud approach nowadays anyway. Some companies also adopt a multi-cloud approach that involves multiple public clouds. Vendor lock-in is when you become so entrenched with a single vendor that you may lose flexibility or negotiating position. Some companies seek to minimize vendor lock-in by using multiple public clouds. Personally, I don't get too concerned about vendor lock-in with our current crop of public cloud providers. As we'll see later in this module, there are some ways to mitigate that risk. Plus, from a skill set standpoint, Having to constantly pivot among multiple public clouds tends to create more challenges than it really helps. When contemplating a move to the cloud, there are several common methods. The first is just simply picking up our existing systems and dropping them on a cloud provider. Same software, same operating system. We call this re-hosting, or it's sometimes called lift and shift as we're just moving things from point A to point B. Now, while this is usually the, the least risky way to migrate to the cloud, it does not typically offer very much benefit in the long run. However, it's a very common first step for many companies. Next, we can re-platform. Instead of just forklifting our systems over, we might be able to take advantage of some of the services provided by our cloud vendor. For example, instead of recreating our database on its own cloud-hosted server, maybe our cloud provider offers a fully managed version of that same database. And by using that fully managed version, we can potentially save on maintenance and fault-tolerant costs. Now, we can decide that rather than moving our applications to the cloud, we might just purchase something that's already in the cloud. For example, we might decide to license some user accounts for a new HR system or a customer relationship management system. And that may be already in the cloud. Workday and Salesforce are examples of these types of systems. Now, if we wanted to get really ambitious, we can totally re-architect our application and systems. We can use all the various services that our cloud provider has to 
create what some people call a cloud native version. This just means that we're using methods that best take advantage of what our cloud provider has to offer. This method tends to yield the best return in the long run, but is also the most complex and risky. Now, maybe through the evaluation of our systems and applications, we figure out that one of our systems isn't being used at all. And if this is the case, since there's a cost to keeping that system running, we can retire that system. Sometimes this is called sunsetting a system or an application. And of course, we can just choose to do nothing. Maybe through our business case process, we find that there's no good reason to mess with an existing system. So we'll just leave it alone, and that's a perfectly valid outcome. Two concepts you hear frequently around cloud computing are virtualization and containerization. Now, if you remember earlier in this module, I said that cloud providers have massive amounts of computing power available for you to use in seconds. Well, they don't have lots of people running around plugging and unplugging cables whenever you request a new system. Cloud providers make use of virtual systems or virtualization. This just means that they can create complete software-based computer systems on top of physical computer hardware. When you request a system, it can be set up or provisioned, as some people call it, in a matter of seconds. And when you're done, it just disappears and the physical system resources can be reallocated to other customers. So what does a cloud provider data center look like? From the outside, they look like a big warehouse. And unless you looked really closely, you probably couldn't tell a data center from any other logistics warehouse. They're usually heavily secured and have lots of extra power and cooling equipment around them. Inside, there's gonna be rows and rows of racks holding physical computers. Of course, those physical computers will host several virtual systems, which get rented out to customers like us as we need them. You might be surprised that these data centers usually only have a very small handful of people working there. Most of the maintenance is automated and people are only needed when something needs a set of physical hands. And data centers are really, really loud. They have lots of cooling equipment running at full blast, trying to keep everything from overheating. Now, an evolution of virtualization is containerization. First, let me explain the problem that containers are trying to solve. Let's say that we have a brand new computer system. Then we start loading software on it. Now, sometimes one software package might create some conflict with another software package, and that results in errors or problems. Now let's say that we get a new computer system and we need to move over some of that software from the old system to the new system and we accidentally leave out part of that software. Well, that could result in problems too. And in, in fact, you might have experienced some of these same problems on your own home computers as you try to upgrade them. Just imagine that problem across hundreds or thousands of systems and you can just see what sort of headache that would cause. Enter containers. Containers are like virtualized systems, but more lightweight. Think of it as a nice, neat little box that's designed to keep things organized. Containers rely on something called a container engine that manages resources and allows the container to share those resources across themselves. So if one container isn't working too hard, another container can take advantage of that. One of the most popular container engines is called Docker. So if one of your IT people use the term Docker container, then you now know what they're talking about. Now, because containers are compartmentalized, that makes them very portable. Since most major cloud providers also support containers, we can pretty seamlessly move those containers to a cloud provider and it'll run just the same as it did originally. Plus, we can use any one of those major cloud providers to host these applications. If we wanted to move the containers back on site in a hybrid cloud model, we could do that too without much trouble at all. The portability of containers is one way companies are mitigating the vendor lock-in concern that I mentioned earlier. So think of containers like a little backpack that holds everything you might need to travel anywhere you want. 
Lastly, I'll leave you with this. We have really just scratched the surface of cloud architecture here. It is a whole discipline that people spend years learning. So if your organization does not have access to cloud architecture experts, I would highly recommend seeking the help of one before you start designing your cloud-based architecture. If you're not careful, you can end up with quite a mess.